Well, due to the fact I can't um, plan well when it comes to charging my camera battery, this battery might, the battery might die, so we might only have one part of this come out today. Um, yeah, so this is some, something that was recommended to me by a subscriber, Pilska, 1811, the Byzantine um, and Bulgarian Wars, and it's by Kings and Generals, so we're watching two Kings and, Gen Kings and Generals videos today. And yeah, so this should be a really good one to watch. Let's get into it. Hopefully we get, you know, all the way into it, but definitely it'll be a part two. If we don't, and it'll come out tomorrow. You know the deal. So yeah, let's do that and In one of the previous episodes, we covered the arrival of the Bulgars to the Eastern Roman Empire's borders and their settling in the Balkans. <coughs> Although the two cultures started fighting almost immediately, the Bulgars played a crucial role in the defense of Constantinople against the Umayyad Caliphate in 717-718. This was a battle that arguably changed the history of Europe, but despite this, the alliance was short-lived and the Bulgars fought the Byzantines in many battles afterwards. Welcome to our first episode in our series on the Byzantine-Bulgarian Wars and the Battle of Pliska. Khan Turval's okay. effective intervention as a Roman ally bestowed a level of international recognition on the Bulgar state, elevating it to an acknowledged European power. This new political entity had a mixture of native Bulgar traditions and Roman influence, a phenomenon which resulted in the presence of both an elite nomadic warrior class and a long-standing bureaucratic structure capable of ruling sedentary populations. Meanwhile, the Eastern Roman Empire was mostly busy with fighting the existential threat of the Caliphate yeah, yeah. and employed a significant portion of its manpower and material. Leo III restored his rule over Anatolia and enacted many legal reforms. When Leo died in 741, he was succeeded by his son, Constantine V, who proved to be a brilliant military commander in short order. Taking advantage of civil wars within the Caliphate, the new emperor invaded Syria and reconquered Cyprus, resettling their Christian populations in Thrace to strengthen imperial authority there. His victories inspired fierce loyalty among the troops, and this allowed Constantine to, amongst other things, create elite corps within the Eastern Roman army, known as Tagmata. These would function as a loyal professional corps of Constantinople's military power, serving as a counterweight to the thematic levies, which had a disturbing tendency to revolt against central power. Like I said, a disturbing tendency to revolt. Like not just saying, you know, like they were revolted a lot. They had a disturbing tendency to revolt. In 757, a truce was finally concluded between the Roman Emperor and the newly constituted Abbasid Caliphate. In addition to achieving most of his wartime objectives, this peace also allowed Constantine to focus on the Balkans and its Bulgar occupiers. This was an opportune moment to attack the First Bulgarian Empire, as its dynastic stability was shattered in 753, when the last ruling member of the Dulos clan, Khan Savar, passed away. After this point, factional rivalries began to undermine central Bulgar authority at the worst possible time. For the next two decades, Constantine continuously fought against short-lived Bulgar Khans in a series of back-and-forth campaigns. When this warrior emperor finally perished from a fever in a campaign against Khan Telerig in 775, the period of existential danger to Bulgaria was, for now, over. Okay. Constantine V was succeeded by Leo IV, and the latter supported Telerig, who lost his throne in a coup led by Kardam. The emperor allowed a marriage between Telerig and his own wife's cousin. Telerig abandoned the Tengriism of his ancestors and embraced Christianity, becoming absorbed into Greco-Roman civilization. At this point, the balance of power between the empire and Bulgaria shifted again, as Kardam began consolidating and building his strength. Meanwhile in the empire, 
Leo IV died in 780, leaving the throne in the hands of his nine-year-old son, Constantine VI, and his mother, Empress Irene. Under these rulers, internal strife within the empire led to difficulties and purges of competent military officers who opposed Irene. Simultaneously, the Abbasid Caliphate now once again took the offensive. Muslim raids into the empire culminated in 782, when Caliph Harun al-Rashid led 100,000 troops in a massive assault into Asia Minor, which reached the suburbs of Constantinople itself. These defeats, and Irene's status as a female Basileus, led to military unrest and a conspiracy to depose her. In 802, a faction rallied around the Roman finance minister Nikephoros, who deposed and exiled Irene. The former then took the throne as Nikephoros I. Under his new Nikephorian dynasty, the empire began a campaign to subjugate the various Slavic Sklaveni in western Thrace, Macedonia and Greece. This success both strengthened the Romans militarily and financially, and more crucially, it prevented Kardam from doing the same. At roughly the same time, Kardam passed away, and Bulgaria gained a talented new ruler named Krum in 803. How he okay. became Khan is not known for certain, but upon his taking power, Krum took decisive action by invading the disintegrating Avar Khaganate. In this endeavor, he advanced in conjunction with Charlemagne, King of the Franks. The Avar remnant was destroyed relatively easily, and the surviving <coughs> elements were subjugated to client status, further increasing the Khan's power. This campaign of conquest extended Bulgarian borders north to the Carpathian Mountains and Transylvania, doubling the state's territory and making it a truly formidable foe. In 807, Nikephoros decided to lead a preemptive assault on the ascendant Bulgars, hoping to forestall any intervention in his other consolidation efforts elsewhere. However, this campaign barely got off the ground when it was terminated due to a thematic revolt against the Emperor. The crucial Anatolian strategoi were irritated that Nikephoros was ignoring the Abbasids, who raided the region again during that year. While the Emperor dealt with the rebellion, Krum attacked. He received intelligence that a 12,000-strong mixed thematic force had amassed in order to receive its pay, and would be vulnerable while it did so. In early 809, the Bulgars marched through secret mountain passes and managed to scatter the Roman force encamped in the Struma Valley, seizing 1,100 pounds of gold. This was not the end of Nikephoros' problems. In order to block imperial expansion northwest, Krum undermined and forced the surrender of Serdica during March 809. Once the city gates were opened, however, the Khan's forces massacred the 6,000-strong garrison and a massive number of civilians. At about this time, Harun al-Rashid passed away and a civil war broke out between his sons. This good news relieved pressure on imperial borders and allowed Nikephoros to fully concentrate on the Bulgar problem. After a series of census and tax reforms, forced population transfers from Anatolia to Greece, Thrace and the Struma Valley were carried out, colonizing these underpopulated areas with Orthodox Greek speakers. The new settlements were given military status, allowing the creation of three new themes, Peloponnesos, Kephalania and Thessaloniki. In total, the Eastern Roman Empire could now call on 14,000 troops from its Balkan themes. Because of this, Nikephoros felt confident by early 811 that he could decisively deal with the Bulgars, destroy their state, and recover lost imperial land in the process. So, throughout March and April, Nikephoros began assembling the largest imperial force in the Balkans since the good old days of Constantine V. All four of the elite tagmatic heavy cavalry units were assembled, including the Excubitors and Arithmos. They were the core shock force of the invading army, the bulk of which was made up primarily of Thracian-themed troops, but also contained some smaller contingents from Anatolia, totaling around 25 to 30,000 soldiers. 
When the great host was finally assembled, the Emperor set out from his capital in May of 811, marching north for the frontier fortress of Marculae, where the different army units would converge. Word of the sheer size and majesty of the imperial formations reached Krum, who was unnerved by its size and began negotiations. An embassy was sent to Nikephoros to reach peace terms, but, with the emperor and his advisors arrogantly certain of final victory, these overtures were dismissed out of hand. After spending June and early July launching deft feints and diversionary attacks to clear the garrisoned mountain passes, the main Roman assault began on July 11, 811. Their objective was clear, Krum's capital at Pliska, and the conflict began as a walkover. News of Nikephoros' approach through the mountains caused panic in the civilian population, who began to flee into the countryside or hills nearby. Krum led his own forces into the mountains as well to avoid being utterly destroyed. However, he left 12,000 soldiers to garrison the capital, but they were slaughtered to a man when the Romans arrived oh, and wow. stormed the city. Yeah. That's not that surprising. Once the city had been thoroughly looted, Nikephoros ordered that the surrounding countryside be ravaged. Crops and animals were either taken or destroyed and atrocities against Bulgar civilians were widespread. Khan Krum, who was still held up in the mountains awaiting reinforcement, could do nothing to help his people. He frantically sent another envoy, offering the Emperor safe passage if he would only just take all plunder he wished and go home. Nikephoros, who was eager to destroy Bulgaria completely, ignored Krum's pleas for peace. On July 21st, the Romans broke camp and marched towards Serdica, hoping to reassert control over the Sophia Basin. During this southwestward march, hubris and lack of discipline began to plague the army. Oh. Progress was leisurely due to the Emperor's overconfidence, and days spent freely looting with no immediate danger had sapped the soldiers' martial spirit. As the army moved towards the mountains, cohesion began to suffer, with increasing numbers of men breaking ranks to plunder or just desert and return home. Seeing this, Nikephoros' officers became worried and urged the Emperor to return to Imperial territory, but they were ignored. The lengthy sack of Pliska and subsequent slow Imperial march gave Krum the time he needed. His troops were rallied, and additional Bulgars were levied to fill the army, including women. In a flurry of activity which contrasted totally with his enemy, Krum ordered scouts to constantly follow the Imperial army, keeping him informed of the Roman marching path at every turn. Moreover, the crucial Mesian Slavic and Avar reinforcements arrived, joining the Khan's army. Although these additional troops made a much needed impact on the morale of his soldiers, Krum realized his army still could not defeat the Romans in open battle. His only hope for revenge would be to catch them in the mountain passes. By July 24th, it was clear that this was happening. The loosely formed Imperial Column was unmistakably marching south towards the Golovo Basin and the Verbitsa Pass beyond it, 30 miles southwest of Pliska. The stage was set for a decisive counterattack. As advanced Imperial units... This is getting intense, man. This is really getting intense marched into the narrow pass, they saw a fortified log palisade blocking their path, which Nikephoros dismissed as a means to prevent entry, rather than deny exit. To make the situation worse, Bulgar warriors were spotted on the heights surrounding them, information which was reported to Nikephoros' headquarters. Realizing that something had to be done, the Emperor ordered a halt to discuss courses of action with his commanders. The Emperor's son, Stavrakius, acted as a spokesman for the commanders, and he recommended an urgent retreat to Marculae, foreseeing a trap. It is reported that Nikephoros became so angry with this constant desire to retreat that the two men almost came to blows. Such bickering amongst the Imperial Command continued for days, all the while Krum's <laughs> preparations were completed. Such a boomer. The Romans lost more soldiers to desertion, and troop morale plummeted. 
By the 25th, it was clear to Nikephoros his army was in a lethal situation, but it was far too late to avert it. Roman inactivity allowed the Bulgars to scout their enemy's deployment in detail. What they found was promising indeed. Krum learned that rather than resting in one fortified encampment, the Imperial army was strung out in a series of smaller camps, each theme detachment having its own. They stretched all the way from the narrow defile through the Preslav mountains in the north to the Kamchia river in the south. Nikephoros's camp, housing courtiers, commanders and the elite tagmatic units, was identifiable by its size and the glittering colours of its tents and banners. As the Roman troops idly milled about the basin, drinking and playing games to pass the time, Krum's eager forces were closing in, getting ready for the fight. By late Friday evening, the preparations had been completed. The Bulgar light infantry were stationed on the heights on either side of the road leading through the Vobitsa Pass, and also on the mountain slopes facing the road from the east. Additional ambushing troops were placed on the southern slopes of the Preslav Mountains to the north. To the west of the Roman encampment chain was Krum's cavalry and the majority of his infantry, forming the main strike force, which was hidden behind a hill in the western part of the basin. In the early dawn hours of June 26th, sentinels guarding Nikephoros' camp began hearing unnerving wails from the mountains, which gradually increased in intensity as the hours went by. Thousands of Bulgar men and women were clattering their equipment together and shouting war cries in order to frighten the enemy. Now half awake, the elite tagmatic troops in the Emperor's camp began to form up, putting on their armor and hastily grabbing their weapons. It was not quick enough. Before the tagmatic could form up, the flower of Nikephoros' army was suddenly struck from the early morning darkness by a mass of Bulgar, Slav and Avar warriors from Krum's main assault force from at least two directions, north and west. The plan was simple, destroy the elite formations and their commanders. In the early minutes of the fighting, Krum's plan worked wonders. During the vicious, disorganized melee, the overconfident Nikephoros, many of his subcommanders and elite troops were killed. The survivors, including the late Emperor's wounded son, fled towards the Vobitsa Pass, desperate to escape. The assorted thematic contingents had been woken up, as planned by the racket coming from the mountainside, and began forming up for battle. It was no good. The sight of the revered Tagmata fleeing in terror and confusion broke their morale, and they too began to rout south. As they did so, increasing numbers of Bulgar ambushing troops descended from the heights and joined Krum's strike force in pursuit. This major defeat turned into a catastrophe during the Imperial Army's flight from Krum's forces. Relentlessly showered by arrow fire from the heights, and relentlessly chased by the Bulgar army, Roman soldiers were bogged down in the mire surrounding the Kamchia River, where many soldiers drowned. Those who made it through were trapped against the palisade constructed by their enemy at the end of the pass. Only a small number of Roman troops survived the Battle of Pliska. Nikephoros' body was also found. His severed head was cleaned out, lined with silver, and then used as a drinking cup for years after by the victorious Krum. Oh wow, that's that's kind of that's kind of uh, crazy right there. The Bulgars now wish to march into the Byzantines' territory, which means that our series will continue. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have. That was pretty good. That was actually pretty uh, pretty good that battle to watch. But yeah, talk to you guys in the next video. Also, if you want to. Um, if you want to give me a video to watch in the comment section, you can. And also, uh, yeah, subscribe to the channel. I want to get a thousand subscribers by Valentine's Day. So please, let's make that happen. Uh, yeah, talk to you guys in the next video and peace.